Greetings and thank you for joining us for this service sponsored by the Princeton University Chapel. My name is Allison Bowden and I serve as Dean of Religious Life and of the Chapel at Princeton. We hope that this will be the final pre-recorded service we ever have to do. We plan to resume in-person services next week, August 29th. Those of you who are in the Princeton area and who are fully vaccinated are warmly encouraged to join us there. Princeton University policy now requires all persons at indoor events to wear masks, and so we will do that. And university policy also restricts attendance at all on-campus events to those who are fully vaccinated. If you are not in the Princeton area, fear not. Starting on the 29th of August, we will be live streaming our Sunday services so you can watch them as they happen. They will also be edited and placed on our YouTube channel shortly afterwards, where they will be archived and you can refer to them anytime you want. Our guest preacher today is Hector Herrera, who several years ago was a seminary intern at the Princeton University Chapel. He is now serving as an international at an international congregation in Tokyo, and you can learn more about him in his bio, which is included in the bulletin for this service. That is posted on the website where you access this video. Hector, it is so good to see you again, even if only on video. Thank you for being our preacher today. Hear now this call to worship. From near and far, God invites us to be present, present to God's own self and to one another, all through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let us set aside all that would distract us from the power and love of God working through our lives and our world, and let us worship God. Our reading for today is from the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Please listen and hear the word of the Lord. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live well. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. The Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan is a classic. Few gospel stories 
and indeed biblical stories and characters in general are as memorable and as popular as the Good Samaritan. It is a brief and instructive story that illustrates Jesus' core teachings. And for some, it is Christian ethics par excellence. With its wide readership, there have been vast and varying interpretations of the Good Samaritan. One prominent read is that the story of the Good Samaritan is a story about the virtues of boundary-breaking universalism and those who help others who are in need. And likewise, it's also a story about the vices of religious hypocrisy, of those who walk past their believing sibling. This reading pushes us as Christians to disrupt the natural tendency to prefer people like us and give radical charity to all those who are in need, no matter who they are or where they're from. This interpretation has filled the Western imagination and has coined many charitable organizations, hospitals, NGOs, and, and all the such. In this reading, the message is simple. We have a duty and obligation to do philanthropic acts who, to people who have been impoverished, beaten, and downtrodden, whether they are in our neighborhood or in a distant developing country. However, this reading has received some pushback, most prominently by Martin Luther King Jr., who said, quote, We are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will only be the initial act. One day, we must come to see the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women who will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars, needs restructuring, end quote. This is the other way to read the story of the Good Samaritan. It wants us to go beyond the individual and individual acts and look into groups and systems. It is corporate, not individual, sin that is prevalent in our society. It is through the evil actions of governments, economic structures, and other forms of group identities that we sin. It is in systems that we have created where we fail to be the Good Samaritan. And I want to keep both of these readings of the Good Samaritan in tension. I don't think they are mutually exclusive. But on the contrary, I think they're both edifying and good to hear. However, I don't want to talk about just individuals and their acts or just systems and their consequences. I want us to turn our attention into our interior castle, the edifices of our souls, the spiritual habits and practices that systematically shape our individual lives. And as a helpful illustration, I want us to turn to my alma mater, Princeton Seminary. 
but during a time that I was not there. The year was 1970. The month was December. Winter was in full swing on the seminary campus. And two researchers from Princeton University were conducting an experiment called From Jerusalem to Jericho, a study of situational and dispositional variables in helping behaviors. As a part of their study, they wanted to replicate a similar environment like one found in the Good Samaritan. And they investigated what 40 seminarian students would do. The seminary students met with a researcher and filled out a bunch of forms about their religious commitments, whether they were intrinsic or extrinsic. Intrinsic reasons being like, I'm motivated to do good in the world. And extrinsic reasons being like, I really want to go to heaven. So after filling out the forms, they were told that, that they needed to prepare a sermon on the Good Samaritan. However, in order to give the sermon, they needed to walk to a neighboring building. And as experiments go, they were randomly given one of three conditions. They were told that they were either going to be in A, they had plenty of time, and that they were early. This is called the low hurry situation. Or they were told B, that they were on time, but they should hurry over quickly so that they wouldn't be late. This is the intermediate hurry situation. Or they were told C, that they were running late and they really needed to go. And this is the high hurry situation. And of course, here's the catch. The researchers hired an actor to have their head down, eyes closed, and lay still, slumped in an alleyway right next to the entrance to the building where the students were going to preach on the Good Samaritan. Remember, it's a cold, cold New Jersey winter. And as the seminarians walked by, the actor would cough and groan and keep his head down. So what did the seminarians do? Remarkably, only 10% in the high hurry situation stopped to help. 45% of the students in the intermediate hurry situation and 63% of the students in the low hurry situation helped the victim. This is what the researchers concluded. A person not in a hurry may stop and offer help to a person in distress. A person in a hurry is likely to keep on going. Ironically, they are likely to keep on going even if they're hurrying to preach on the parable of the Good Samaritan. Thinking about the Good Samaritan did not increase helping behavior, but being in a hurry decreased it. I have to stop and wonder, what if those seminarians prayed, prayed for God's speed as they left to preach? In somewhat modern English, God's speed is an expression of good wishes to a person that is starting a journey. The phrase comes from Middle English, Godspeed, meaning, may God flourish you. And God's flourishing is never just for an individual, but it is a flourishing for all those whom you pass along life's journey. The Japanese theologian Kosuke Koyama wrote a book entitled, Three Mile an Hour God. 
He noticed that the average speed that a human walks is about three miles per hour, which is about five kilometers per hour. Jesus, who is God, walked at three miles per hour. God, who is love, walks at five kilometers per hour. Love has a speed. This is what Kuyama says. And that the, that speed, that speed is slow. That speed is gentle. That speed is tender. That is God's speed. We are made in the image of God. And maybe this is why we sometimes get frustrated with God. We want to speed by to get an answer. We want God to do what we want, and we want God to do it right now. And in fact, God, God is walking slow. Jesus walked around all of Palestine and Galilee like the Good Samaritan. And God is doing what God is doing in God's time. And we have to slow down a bit. It is in our spiritual practices where we embrace the systemic and the individual. If we can change our soul's habits, then we will be able to see God's presence and action in the world and have systemic change. We need to be attentive to God's presence and action in the world. And if we want to be attentive to God, we must walk alongside God. And to do that, we have to challenge our inner structure Challenge the culture of speed, productivity, and efficiency. These things have shaped our reality in the 21st century. But by slowing down, we might paradoxically catch up with God and be attentive to our neighbor, to our wounds, and to God's presence and action. May we all walk at God's speed. Amen.
please join me in a spirit of prayer. Our gracious God, we live in the balance of hope and uncertainty. Hope that our lives may return to what you think of as normal and regular and blessed with the activities and personal fellowships we thrive upon. But the uncertainty remains as COVID flares around us, as people fall ill and die, and the routines we hoped to get back to are compromised by safeguards we must implement. Help us to live well through all uncertainty, to focus our love upon the ill and the grieving, and to love our neighbors by keeping them safe. We pray for those with COVID the world over, for the children who are the newest victims, and for those who make the decisions that affect public health. We pray for the people of Haiti in the wake of the earthquake there, for the people of, Afga of Afghanistan, Myanmar, Colombia, Ukraine, and every place of volatility and violence. We pray for communities everywhere, for all who are poor, without housing, who face eviction, who endure hate and discrimination, who are unseen and unheard. We pray for all who are ill, including Jack, Marge, Betty Johnson, Mary Ann, Jackie, and Joe. We pray for all who grieve the loss of one beloved. We pray for the Princeton University community and all who eagerly look forward to coming together again, that we may practice love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love seeks the good of all. Love is welcoming. Love is understanding. We pray for every community that is on fire, that is experiencing drought, that is experiencing flooding. May we all be convicted to address climate change, whatever our location in life. May we see one another. May we care for one another. May we dare to love one another with the love of Christ and thus dare to be transformed. Hear us as we offer the prayer that Jesus taught us to say every day. Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And let us continue in a spirit of prayer as we offer the prayer for Princeton. O eternal God, the source of life and light for all peoples, we pray you would endow this university with your grace and wisdom. Give inspiration and understanding to those who teach and to those who learn. Grant vision to its trustees and administrators, to all who work here and to all who bear her name. Give your guiding spirit of sacrificial courage and loving service. Amen. Receive this benediction. May all that is holy, faithful, and true overwhelm our minds, hearts, and spirits, and thus lead us into all true freedom, whatever our days may demand of us. Amen.